Heidi. Heidi Bullhecker. And she's going to be doing the shared histories, uh, finding Mississauga Council fires in the Colonel Archive. So let's have a round of applause for Heidi. with you. I've also got some colleagues from uh, U of T who come also. There's Brian from History at UTM and um, Sherry and Yayu, the reference librarian from Anthropology and the library and some students who come as well. Uh, and, and we're also really grateful and excited by the relationship the Mississaugas uh, now have with the University of Toronto, the different campuses, uh, and Chief LaForme's presence at Massey College and the new Royal Chapel, the dedicated chapel there. So these are um, really encouraging times and we've really seen some changes at the university especially since the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the university's own steering committee response and now renewed commitment to um, well actually just new commitment to indigenous studies and to creating more respectful relationships and working together in new and in good ways. So I'm really happy to be here with you today. Um, we got some slides. I got a lot of slides. Hopefully, uh, and I, I, I talk. The title of the talk is "Shared Histories," and it's called "Finding Mississauga Council Fires in the Colonial Archives." And it's shared uh, the, the, it shared multiple ways. Shared because of the collaborations that are really necessary between uh, Indigenous knowledge keepers and community experts and, and non-Indigenous um, colonial archives and sources to really put together a, a new history of this land that we now all share. Um, and it's also shared histories because of the shared histories, as, as Margaret was talking about before lunch, between the Mississauga council fires themselves, right? These, uh, the, the separation and the division that colonialism created with separate reserves and everyone being uh, separated and now with the new and exciting work putting the communities back together. So it's shared in that way as well. get my own slides to work, which they're not, oh, there we go. Okay, so I want us to begin with the present and making history in the Mississauga Nation Accord, 29th October 2016, and just say how exciting this is to see, uh, as a historian, the, the six nations of uh, the Mississaugas coming together to sign this really historic agreement and to see where this is going to now take uh, the Mississaugas in the years to come. And to congratulate you on that. Okay, and I, I took this opportunity to put the um, logos of the various nations on this map, this outline map of the Great Lakes. Um, in their roughly present locations, I appreciate in, in the Court of the Lakes region, it's a bit of a squish and not exactly on the right spot. But to, un, uh, but to underscore in the talk today, that when we're talking about reclaiming these histories, these are dynamic histories. And there are lots of continuities I'm going to be talking about today between Mississauga Nation and Council Fires in particular locations. There have also been historic changes, lots of change. Um, neither of these are bad things. They're, they're all part of uh, the rich history of the Mississauga Nation. Okay. And a critical way this is going to have to happen um, really is by bringing together archival documents and material culture in which so much rich uh, Anishinaabe history broadly, indigenous history uh, is stored uh, in conversation with oral history and community knowledge. And this is a, um, as some of you may know, Alan Corbier, a longtime friend and colleague who's worked with me on the Great Lakes Research Alliance for many years. He's in um, Geneva, Switzerland in this photo with uh, working with the Haldeman collection that's there. Okay, these are gifts, diplomatic gifts, that uh, Governor General Haldeman, Frederick Haldeman, who signed the Haldeman Grant in 1784 uh, was for the Six Nations land, was the Governor General at the time of the American Revolution. Well, he received a lot of diplomatic gifts, and they're in a museum in Geneva. And here he is with Alan's holding one of these assailed 
uh, canoes, a canoe with a sail on it, a model canoe. And on the left, I have an image from the Codex Canadensis, which is a manuscript book of paintings and illustrations meant to accompany a rich natural history of the region. It's full of Nishnabeum um, by Father Louis Nicolette around 1600. And you can see in it also there's a canoe with a sail. See, there's so much we can bring together. And Alan Corbier has been one of the real uh, pioneers, uh, leaders and pioneers. Oh, that's a terrible word to use, sorry. Um, it, well, real leader in this, uh, <laughs> everyone's laughing there. Yeah, terrible word to use. Uh, real leader in this co collaborative and interdisciplinary methodology. Okay, uh, we'll just go with that one. Um, and this is part of this larger group called GRASAC, the Great Lakes Research Alliance, which when we started 15 years ago, we're using Aboriginal, and we don't change it to Indigenous now because then we'd be grass sick, and that didn't sound very good. Um, so we are a large group now of um, people working both in community and they're members of uh, uh, Mississauga Nation uh, uh, community researchers uh, who are also part of this group. Uh, and uh, we have we started working extensively with museum collections in in England and in France and in the United States and in Canada. Uh, and now we're beginning also to work with sort of the documentary archive. And I'm telling you about it because we not only have a research database, uh, but we're now in the process of producing a public database to take our research data uh, where it's not involving sacred and sensitive material in consultation uh, with elders and knowledge keepers about what's appropriate to share on the open internet and to make that um, available. So watch for that in the fall of this year. Now. Part of this practice then involves reclaiming shared histories from museums and archives and the changing work that's happening in, in the discipline, the academic discipline of history. So no history hasn't always been kind or fair or accurate when it comes to telling the history of indigenous peoples in North America and Turtle Island. It's not been uh, 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 any of those things. Um, but change is underway. One of the things that's happening is a shift towards community-oriented and collaborative research. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, that's the grass, grass that group. Sorry. That's our URL. And that's our, sorry. And at the bottom, yeah, there are actually two groups involving uh, community um, uh, collaborations, which we're working with material culture, uh, but we also want to start doing that kind of work with records that are in the documents that are in archives. And we start to understand research in this context as expressions of indigenous sovereignties. Right? We're reclaiming these histories. And also to do so in a way that integrates and informs land and place-based learning. So getting out of the archives and onto the land and doing the kind of work that we saw this morning right, with Brett uh, Yaganobe's presentation on um, on the kinds of learning that comes from actually being out on the land and knowing those stories that are coming from, uh, uh, from those places. Okay, so, but uh, uh, what I'm going to talk today to you specifically about is how um, new online sources are making it possible to do things that historians used to only, professional historians could only do, right? Go into archives and spend weeks and months looking through manuscript collections that in the last decade, we've seen a tremendous explosion of web-based resources available. And this can really be a spur to and support community research. So a lot of the documents and, and sources that uh, were really only open to a quite privileged few are you now increasingly accessible. And I'm gonna not just, I'm gonna talk to you about some of those sources and how you can access them, but I also could give some examples, particularly with maps to show um, some of the challenges of using them to understand Mississauga history. Okay, the first one is actually a secondary source. It's, um, it's a scholarly uh, product called the Dictionary of Canadian Biography. How many of you have heard of the Dictionary of Canadian Biography? A few hands have gone, excellent, okay. If you haven't, check it out. Uh, it is a great place to start if you're looking for biographies of well-known Indigenous leaders. There are people in this room I know who've contributed uh, uh, biographies, including Don Smith, uh, of, of Mississauga Nation uh, leaders to this uh, collection, and they're continuing to grow. Um, they're a great place to start also finding out where there are uh, sources about that individual's life. 
This source, like the other online sources I'm going to talk about today, are also in, now interested in, and I think, again, we can look to the TRC as, as, uh, as helping to spur this conversation, in correcting the record. Right? So if you're using this source, and I, I, I know my wonderful colleagues who work on this uh, at the University of Toronto, uh, and at Laval, who are the editors of this, and you find something that you know it does not represent your community properly, or is an in, inaccurate statement, reach out, email them, because these are now, this is a changing time, and this is a time to now start getting um, uh, these Indigenous histories told uh, in a more accurate way. You'll also see, though, when you come to this source, just the problems of doing research on Mississauga history, uh, as with all Indigenous histories in now Canada, uh, just even the problems of spelling and names, right? Just how do you, how do you get in, in, in access because of the lack of standardization and the wildly random approaches to spelling so many colonial officials had, uh, and also varying or complete lack of understanding of any Anishinaabewan. So, uh, so that's the Dictionary of Canadian Biography. The next one I want to talk about is, has just been made available as of January the 1st. And I don't know if you are aware of this, but there has been a massive digitization push through um, an organization called Canadiana.ca. And I, I've got a list at the end of my presentation with all the URLs for anybody who wants them. And cause, yes, because you want them. And uh, this, like other um, organizations, so the Canadian Institute for Historical Microreproductions used to produce all that microfiche, and Margaret knows this very well, all that microfiche. Uh, they, 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 they branched out into the digital world now. And until January 1st, you had to have access through a library, and it was a subscription-based system. And as of January the 1st, it's now free to everybody to spend all their hours late at night looking at reels of microfilm that have been digitized. And my husband probably wishes this was not the case. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, there are three sources, one of which looks at more uh, government documents on the left. Early Canadiana Online, which um, has digitized all the books printed in Canada prior to 1900. All of them. And you can keyword search them all. You can read Peter Jones, they're all there. Um, and Heritage is a digital collection of microfilmed man of manuscript material. All those handwritten government records, RG10 records. They're adding new ones all the time. But there are tens of thousands of millions of pages to go through. Um, and so by, uh, this, again, has become available now, and it's freely available. There are also on the left two links there. One is the digitization and preservation link. Um, this organization is also giving, through the National Digitization Strategies, grants to digitize new materials, so something that communities may wish to consider. And they note at the bottom that they're interested in being a trustworthy digital repository. And again, like the Dictionary of Canadian Biography, firm statement on this, they want to tag and improve the searchability of this material in appropriate ways. Okay, so that means that if there are words in the Shabayan that should be part of the, the, the um, tagging, you, know, you can email them and tell them. They want to know that. They want to be in partnership with communities and they want to correct, uh, to make these records accessible. Now, um, Let's talk then about how do you, if you've got all these incredible resources, oh, just, let me just go back, uh, sorry, go back, let's go back, the, nope, forward, forward, forward. I don't have a clicker, so I just have to wave over here. Um, just a caveat about some of these. The, the um, early Canadiana online, like so many others, um, these books that were digitized prior to 1900. So there's some really rich, for example, language resources in there, Chamberlain's manuscripts or books on the Mississauga language, things like that. There's also some really racist material. I'll just be absolutely blunt. So there, you, there are books that were published prior to the year 1900. So uh, you know, be, be aware of that. Um, the manuscript material as well includes all of this government materials and um, uh, records produced by colonial administrations, which comes with its own set of problems. So enough about that, but just letting you know. Okay, next slide. Finding the Mississauga. Again, 
when you enter into this uh, research world, and as Margaret was nodding about earlier, and I believe Brett was speaking as well um, this morning, uh, just about the ran wildly random approach to spelling, uh, you do, however, find um, uh, the presence of the Mississauga Nation in these historical records. This is actually um, uh, an excerpt from Paul Lejeune's Jesuit Relations of 1640. He gives in this these pages from pages 227 to 229, he describes all the nations in the Great Lakes region that were known to the French in 1640. It's really a rich, long list. And they're not just na nations he's met, there are nations he's heard about from others. And I think a couple of things stand out, should stand out to you from this. This is just the excerpt from the East Georgian Bay area. So to sail further up the lake from the Wenda, we find in the north, the West Arini, farther up are the Uchigue, farther up the mouth of the river which comes from Lake Nipissin are the Chiliquan, and then beyond the same shores of this freshwater sea are the Amakwe. Uh, the French in this period used an O-U to mean a W um, when it's transcribed in this way. Or the nation of the beaver, and to the south of these is an island in this freshwater sea about 30 lakes long, that's Manitoulin Island, inhabited by the, the Ottawan. These are the people who have come from the nation of the raised hair. That's what Champlain called the people because of their hairstyles, right? So after the Amakwe, I'm on the same shore of the Great Lake are the Omisage, the Mississauga, who we passed while proceeding to Bawich de Gwen. By that is actually, believe it or not, Bawating. Okay, I know, I know. It's like, what the? Yeah, that's, that there's effort to write Bawating. The nations of the people of the salt, so for that, or the salt. For in fact, there is a rapid which rushes at this point into the freshwater sea. And what also should strike you about that is the number of those terms that are in Nishtabewin. And you're going to see that in the sources I'm going to show. Um, this is another wonderful source you can spend a lot of time on. Uh, notice uh, the first when you first approach this page, it is in French. There is a bar at the top that lets you select um, English, and then it will produce this. This is the archives of France. They have in their digital collections digitized all their maps, uh, including their maps for um, for what's now Canada. So these are amazing, and you're going to find that there's lots of references. You can find the Mississauga in them. Uh, in 1677, this is a map. Um, next one. Oh, wait, there's the. Go back one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is the front page uh, of, their, uh, of their website. Okay, next one. I have to keep looking over here. Sorry. Uh, 1677. This is actually a not very ac uh, cartographically accurate map. It was actually based on one done by Champlain with some extra names put in, in 1777. So when we do the, this is actually all of the Northeast. You can see there's the St. Lawrence is there, um, that sort of Newfoundland off to the right, and then the Labrador Peninsula, and this thing in the middle is James Bay up at the top, the ocean. Yeah, it's, it's, they didn't have modern GPS technology. They couldn't Google Earth it. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is. Next, but some of them are actually pretty good. So this is a close-up. These maps are scanned at incredibly high resolution. So I was able to grab the screenshot from this next one. Okay, you can zoom right in and read these. These are big maps. Uh, and you'll see at the top, now that is Bawating again. Bawating, right? It's the P and the B. And then the, that little symbol, the eight, is actually the OU. And then they've written Wenjanak. But I think they were trying to go for Bawating. Yeah, I know, it's, uh, but that's what they were doing. Okay, so next you come along, the Mississaugas actually, um, not on this particular map, but you'll see that they have the Nipissings are on air. And then below them though, below them, and, and you're saying, where is, where is this river to Lake Nipissing? Below the, what's the French River, which is this coming into Lake, um, number seven is actually Lake Nipissing, uh, the Algonquins. Now, does this mean the Algonquins of Eastern Ontario and Quebec were in this area? No, not necessarily, no. In fact, one of the challenges of using these maps is that the maps themselves were often constructed from other maps. 
The cartographers weren't always the people who were on the ground. Sometimes they were drawing them from getting information from one source, like a new updated explorer's account, and using other maps that were on file to produce the new map. That's one thing. And the other thing is that they misnamed people all the time. Okay, part of their, uh, the ways in which um, these map makers and these explorers recorded people, they weren't paying attention to the subtleties of uh, Nishinaabe governance. And sometimes what they called a nation was actually a reference to the dotum of the Ogama, who was the keeper of the council fire at a particular location. And sometimes it was the name of people from a particular place, like the Balating Arini, the people of Balating. Uh, and sometimes they interchanged them. Sometimes they used the French name. So at, at what now is Sault Ste. Marie at Balating, you'll see Sauteur, which is referring to the jumpers, referring to the rapids. And they're all talking about the same people. So the maps don't always get it right, uh, but they do provide us some interesting clues into uh, Mississauga history. So the fact that they're not on this particular map um, doesn't necessarily mean anything. We also got some information about Champlain. We've got Sauteurs down here. Okay, next, next one. 1688, this is a beautiful map. You can spend hours, there's a lot of Anishinaabeguin on this map. Whoever did this map either knew the language or knew somebody who knew the language really well and was working with them. So this is great. 1688, Coronelli. It's corrected and augmented um, by uh, uh, Sierra Tillimon from 1688. So let's just zoom in. This is the whole Great Lakes and the Mississippi's on there as well. This is all of New France. Again, a huge map, and you can really zoom in. Um, you next one. All right. Now, on this, you see the North Shore. They've included the mountains on the North Shore on this one. This is beautiful. They've got the sauteur at the top, and they gain the word sauvage, which in this period was more translated as wild or not living in a, uh, at, in a city or a town, as opposed to having negative connotations. Um, they've got the names of the missions. They also have like a Huron village right there, village on, the, on 16, in 1688. Then if you come along, you don't see the Mississauga until the very bottom of the map, over in the middle of Georgia Bay, where those Algonquins were on the last map. Uh-huh. That's, oh, next one. Oh, can you back up for me? Sorry. One more. Where'd it up? Your map and my map do not correspond. Okay. So the Mississauga is on this one. That's where the name uh, is showing up on this particular map. Okay, there is a pointer. That's a hammer, no. Great. Uh. Okay. And the other thing that I, I don't have the close up for this one, but I can't, I, so I can't show you is up here, where um, is the Agawa Canyon? It actually says um, the writings, les écritures, um, referring to the pictographs, but they don't show, uh, this map does not show the Peterborough petroglyphs, the teaching rocks. So part of the reason for that, and where you get a lot more information about the North Shore and the French River area, of course, is that's the principal route the French were traveling. They weren't coming into Southern Ontario to the same extent. Um, so they weren't seeing the full extent. They were including the information about the nations that they were, uh, or the, the council fires that they were most in contact with. Now if we move to, so you saw where the Mississaugas were on that map. Let's go to the next slide, 170. Oh, what happened there? It fell off. Can you just go down? Yeah, there's the, oh no. Don't know what happened with that. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, great piece of Montreal which there you have the Mississaugas on it with the Animakeek dotum. An Amaqua chief signed this, the great piece with the beaver dotum up here. Um, we have also two cranes appearing on this. Uh, 
great peace. And this great peace at Montreal brought together nations from throughout the Great Lakes region. Over 2,000 people gathered at Montreal in 1701, and there were people from the Western Great Lakes as well, from the Illinois, from the Six Nations, uh, from the Miami. So it was a, quite a, a massive gathering. And we also have the um, uh, two different cranes, one from Bawating and one from just east of the Ottawa River. They're just going to get Barry to keep that in mind. But what, what was going on here? Who are uh, these, uh, these, these people? 1703 map. Again, this is again showing all the next slide, showing all the um, uh, all of New France in North America. So the huge swamp in French claims. They were claiming Hudson's Bay too at this time period. Uh, the English, of course, were had. Um, claimed Hudson's Bay as well. Um, next slide, we'll close up. Now this map, there we are in the Mississauga where you'd expect them to be, right? This is the, right between um, Sault Ste. Marie and then of course the Emaqua or Beaver on the French River. And the unnamed Algonquin again, happening right there. Next slide. So I put them on, the dotum image is on. Um, so it's important, I think, to, to see that the French in this period who were doing this mapping thought these nation names were really important. And then, so they thought they were important enough to record on the maps. But just because those names were there, I think, does not mean that there were not Anishinaabe people throughout southern Ontario. And that the connections of Mississauga families didn't go far beyond uh, just a people from what's now a Blind River. Next. Okay, 1729. Another map. This one was presented to the uh, French Academy of, of uh, Sciences. And we see again the similar. Um, next slide, close up. And then this is it. See the Mississauga up there again. And actually, this one looks very much like the other map, right down to its details. So you can see again, even though years separate the maps, often the map makers are reaching back to other earlier maps. And now they've got some, um, this is 1729, but if you'll notice, they've got some Haudenosaunee villages still on the North Shore of Lake Ontario. Well, by 1729, those villages weren't there. Next slide. Okay. This would be 1744 is not showing up on this. Okay, the last one I'm going to show you. Um, and this one's interesting if you go to the next slide. Because this is down by Lake St. Clair. And there's a Missis Mississauga village, which we know historically there were also Mississaugas extending right over to and signing treaties in the area of what's now Detroit. Okay. Oh, sorry, I lied, 1755. This is um, Canada and Louisiana, so all of sort of the seaboard uh, um, Great Lakes region all the way down. And this one I love because, if you go to the next one, yeah, this is that source, next. We have down here in French a city of Mississaugas. This is ville instead of village. There's like been thousands of them, I think. You just imagine the kind of annual gatherings uh, in these kinds of places. But again, and curiously, you now what's this? Southern, Eastern Ontario? What are the Iroquois doing there in 1755? Hmm, makes you wonder what was going on with these maps. So these maps are both a rich source and a set of problems, right? And they can't, we can't just grab from one. We have to uh, both look very carefully at the map makers and what they were doing and who they were borrowing map, map ideas from. Um, but, but the continued presence, however, I think, of the Mississaugas in those same places, when you put that in conjunction with oral history and community memory, just makes this really rich, reinforced story about uh, the Mississauga nation. Now then, um, but we need to also then, I think, go beyond the Mississauga nation when we are doing this sort of historical research, and that is, again, because of the tradition of dotum governance. And because these European visitors so often heard dotum when they were asking people who they were. 
And there's a ways, ways in which, if we go to the next slide, this is from, again, from Paul Lejeune, and he, this is when he's talking about who is living in what's now um, Mississauga Nation territory, and so, so central southeastern Ontario. We find uh, the Wetch Karini, which we call the Petite Nation of the Algonquins. Going still farther up the river, we find the Kitchisiparini, so the people of the Ottawa River, or the Great River. And to the north, the Kota Wetomimi. To the south are the Kenoshisparini, or the Pike people. Um, the Matawechkarini, and then you can see here that shifts, the language shifts, and that's an Okwehonwe language, right? So what's going on here? The rest of the names here are all phonetically spelled efforts at tackling Nishnabewin. So what, in fact, were those nations? And I think those were council fires. Those were Anishinaabe council fires, and the ones that are being named for uh, a dotum are likely referring to the dotum of the, uh, the Ogama, who is the firekeeper for that, that community. Um, and then the ones that were named for places, because people use these names interchangeably, right? And so either could be used. I mean, we do this in English too, right? We, we use different names to refer to, we talk about Washington DC or the White House, and it all kind of means the same thing. We use different, and here I think also people were using metaphor um, to act as synonyms for the names of the same place, the same people. Now, Peter Jones uh, gave a great description on Anishinaabe governance in his History of the Ojibwe Indians. He describes two types of councils. The first, general councils, where federal unions are formed, war and peace is declared, and treaties are made or renewed, and boundaries of territories are established, big boundaries. And he described common councils as where local affairs were settled, such as the sale and division of lands, settling disputes, adopting other Indians into their own body, and transaction of business with the British government. And what's really amazing is in all the uh, treaties for uh, Southern Ontario and the treaties with the Mississauga, you see who's signing those uh, treaties are the, the, the common council. And who is signing, um, and they're all signed with dotum images, and they're all signed uh, um, um, until the mid-19th century, and they're all uh, in a particular order. The Ogama always signs first, the unique Ogama second, and the council uh, which follows. So it's very much present in this structure. So if you could flip to the next. Yeah, there's Peter Jones. Okay, next slide. Okay, 1701 then was a general council, like a huge regional council. It was an enormous, it wasn't about land, it was about creating a, a good relationship with the French and stopping a conflict with uh, the Haudenosaunee. Next slide. Here are um, some manuscript uh, excerpts from two common councils for land transactions in southern Ontario. And these are, this is a, this is a really amazing characteristic of all these um, uh, treaties that Mississauga signed and other uh, Chippewas at Rama signed, is that you have these dotive images and signing which reflect, I argue, the composition of the common councils. And when you see on this um, the, 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 you know, the principles of, of dotive governance in action, when you see that uh, the leadership comprises um, uh, representation from the dotum of the sky world, of the terrestrial world, of the water world, that's all there. What's missing from this are the women. I know that there were women's councils, the principal women who are advisory. They show up on three early British treaties. The British mention that the treaties are with the chiefs, the warriors, and the principal women. Uh, they don't sign the treaties, though. It's just the, uh, the men of the council. Um, but you see, I want to just draw your attention in particular. Do you remember that initial enumeration of Paul Lejeune and he said the Pike Nation, the Kenosha Spirini? Look, we've got Pike here. And we've got Pike here at Rice Lake. And I don't think this is an accident. So when Margaret was saying earlier, you know, we, we talk about the history of Mississauga Nation coming into southern Ontario in the late 17th century, I think Mississauga Nation history as Anishinaabe people in this region goes back a lot farther, and I think we can start to prove that with these genealogies of the, of the dotum. I think Anishinaabe people in this region govern themselves through alliances 
with their, with their dotum through the interdependent alliances of their councils, and that you see this reflected in these land sale documents, but that they connect back to the families who were there before. Next slide. You can see the British actually kind of recognize this because on the, um, the this is one of some of the documents that are available in those collections, and I'm uh, this is I've transcribed this so you can read it because it was illegible. Um, but this is a, a return taken at the River Humber in, in August of 1824. So once after the War of 1812, once the British start paying annuities, of course, then they have to know to whom they're paying annuities and. Uh, yes, my ancestors did write everything down, including when they were um, being dishonest. But they wrote everything down, and they wrote, <laughs> and they wrote down to whom they were giving presents, and how many people. And what you can see here, and they do this in many other documents as well, is they're actually enumerating by, um, by the dodo of the principal man of the particular family in that particular, uh, at the River Humber. And you can see again, We've got, um, and they're using pike, they're using the word tribe here for, na for, uh, for dotum. But you can see, uh, even the British are recognizing that this was a pretty important part of um, Mississauga governance. But it went, if you go to the next slide, this goes throughout the region too. One of these documents that uh, you can get on this new heritage website that I just sent you uh, to is um, the Indian Affairs Census records are there. And um, this is a survey from 1850 from Lake Nipigon, north of Lake Superior. And they list by dotum. The first one is moose. The second one is burbot, which is actually catfish, channel catfish, is uh, using the French term. Loon, eagles, um, bear, kingfisher, lynx, reindeer, carp, and then a single notation for half-breed in 1850. Okay, so, um, so this is th these records are there and they're waiting to be uh, to be uncovered and put put back into action. Now, heading off to the archives from the comfort of your own home, which I'm just give you a little bit of a quick tour of, of that. Um, to further this work, because I think here is where, uh, going forward, there's some really uh, new and exciting histories of the Mississauga Nation to be recovered from, from the material that's now available, and that's available to a much wider audience. So this is from Early Canadiana Online, from their website. As I said before, it's published books of government documents and the entire set of the Jesuit relations. Now those documents, those missionary accounts, they were produced for sale in the 17th and early 18th century to be sold in France to raise money for the mission effort. So that's when they were written. They were originally written in France, in French, sorry. They were originally written in French, sometimes in Italian, occasionally in Latin. They were translated in the late 19th century into English. And the set of books, if you go to the next slide, the set of books, next slide, um, down in the early Canadian collection, just below that is the link to all the Jesuit, all 73 volumes of the Treasure Relations. It's the late 19th century translation, which has its own problems because it was translated in the late 19th century, uh, but it is still a really, um, a really rich source. You can keyword search anything in here. If you go into the Aboriginal Studies collection, it does have 900 entries. If you put in just the word Mississauga with the asterisks, um, you need that to include Mississauga or Mississaugas, you will get only 28 sources. Okay. But that is because, first of all, it's covering the country, but also because so much of, the, of those, uh, those print sources are actually, um, they didn't always use the, there has to be like Mississauga was in the title or it's been tagged. So you'll find Peter Jones with that. You'll find Chamberlain's um, description of the Algonquin or Mississauga language but you won't find bigger works on Ojibwe history like William Warren's work through that. You'll have to go, uh, in, go in a little more deeply. Look for Ojibwe, look for Chippewa, okay? Look for these older terms that were used uh, to get at those books. But they're all free now. Um, next, next slide. We'll take a quick discussion of, um, so the heritage has got, um, <coughs> 40 million pages of primary source documents. Keep you busy for the rest of your life. Um, 
no, you, you can actually keyword search. And that is, again, one of the things they're looking is if you do come across documents uh, that need additional keywords, you can add them. You can, you can add them to the, and help uh, grow the collection. So if you put in just Mississauga in this, you'll get only 103 entries. But there'll be, there's lots you won't get. For example, this is a list of goods received in June 11th, 1853, which was the last year presents were distributed. Uh, volume um, 621 of the Indian Affairs records for the Northern Superintendency, the entire reel, go to the next slide, the entire reel uh, of, has been, a microfilm has been digitized, you can, it's a very good viewer, you can work through it, but you, you won't find, this clearly is about the Lake Huron Indians, that's what the title of the document is, the census of the, the goods given to Lake Huron Indians, which includes the Mississaugas, right? but it's not going to show up under any other uh, conventional search. So this was just an effort, um, next slide, to give you a bit of an overview of some of these rich sources that are available and to say that the, the historical work here is really only beginning. Um, if you have promising young, you have sons or daughters who are like history in school, you know, and they've been keeping up on their French a bit, but they're also studying Nishinaabewin and, and, and working with their elders, and they might want to come do a joint degree in history and indigenous studies because there's lots of work to do and also to contribute through community collaborations because I think we're just at the beginning of, of pulling back sort of the covers on those archives and really getting into, um, you know, what Margaret was talking about, about the truth of what really has happened and, and, and writing new histories. So I'll happily answer any questions. And uh, I put this, if you go to the last slide, I've put up a link to some of the sources that I mentioned. Um, it's actually a live, you should be able to, if you can get the, I have been assured that this will be attached to the presentation in some way, so you can actually go to those links. Uh, I'm happy to answer any more questions you have about this. Thank you. Does everyone feel like rolling up their sleeves now and transcribing documents? Oh, got a question? Yeah. Gary. Ah. Did they buy any of these maps to the uh, colonial records of New York State? Oh, yes, absolutely. So the, um, are there maps to the colonial records of New York State? I abs absolutely. I hadn't even gotten into the New York Colonial Archives. So um, there are another set of sources. Thank you for that. There's another because the Mississaugas of the Credit, in particular, had a special relationship um, and were the uh, sort of, I guess, head of external affairs. or had that relation, very close relationship with the Six Nations uh, during the 18th century. They do show up in the um, papers of Sir William Johnson, uh, and uh, there's mention of them. And the New York Colonial Archives does have um, significant material as well. There's also the Minnesota Historical Society and the Michigan Historical Society who've also undertaken digitization projects. So if you're looking for ancestors who may have migrated or come from the U what's now the U.S. side, um, there's all good records available in those collections as well. Absolutely. Thank you for reminding me of the entire United States history and the National Archives and Records Administration. Um, University of Toronto Library now has in at Robarts, you can come in, yeah, unfortunately it's not digitized yet, but we do have all the microfilm of the, all the U.S. treaties. Um, and we do have the entire 20 volume collection of all U.S. treaties by Alden Vaughan that's been, um, they've been transcribed and printed and bound and they're at Robarts and you can as a member of the public come in and look at them. You're not allowed to take them out, but you could look at them. So that's, that's there as well. And so there's a lot of cross-border, um, the border. Who put that there? Uh, you know, really, right in the middle. Um, but uh, there was a lot of, uh, of Anishinaabe leaders who were signing treaties on both sides of the border, especially in that late 18th, early 19th century period. And names appear on both sides. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, 
absolutely. So um, it's not that we don't have the earliest treaty that has a dotem image on it is the seven that we I know of is the 1701 piece of Montreal. The earliest mention of a dotem image being written on a document, but unfortunately the document's been lost. Um, it was a piece that occurred, um, uh, an alliance ceremony, sorry, that occurred at, at Bawating in 1671. So we have the list of the nations that were present, don't have their dotem images, but I have a description that they signed, and I have a description that there was uh, at least an, a caribou, um, a sturgeon, a beaver, um, because the interpreter was fascinated. He kept saying, these people don't have a writing system while well, he was watching them write, so he... Was, that we have that, that uh, description. And that was, it's called a, that happened in June of, of 1671. But the, the records, the names of the quote unquote nations that the French are recording in Southern Ontario in, um, in the 1640s and the 1630s, some of those names are clearly um, names in Nishnabewan. They're not in any of the Okwehonwe languages. And it, and it really does suggest strongly, especially when you see the continuity with later dotem images, that they're, they're, these people were here. Um, the other, so I hope that, so we don't have the, the images on the, on the treaties earlier than that. What we do have also, I don't have any images here to show you, obviously, because that would require you know, permission from Curve Lake. Um, but if you've been to the Teaching Rocks at, uh, um, just outside of Peterborough, there are images on that, including a crane, which is just like the spitting image of some of the cranes on some of the, the, um, the, the so there's a, and the interesting thing about that is, uh, and I didn't get into that in my talk, there is actually a very consistent graphic vocabulary that when the chiefs and principal men were signing treaties, I mean, they could have represented their beings, animal, their dotem beings any which way, right? But there's actually a very consistent way they do it. And it's either, the animal is either, in an act of vigilance, so you see caribou with a tail raised, right? Uh, or it's in an act of um, providing food. So you'll see be um, eagles, their, their talons are outstretched. You know, it's the, just at the moment before they grab the fish, right? Um, and, and, you know, I've argued that I, I think this is very much because those are core principles of Anishinaabe leadership. The leaders were actually choosing to represent their, their donkey in that very particular particular way. So you see continuity, I guess, on the images that are on the teaching rocks, which we know is very old. So I think there's, there's that kind of uh, a continuity. Um, you know, and there are oral histories, if you've read Leanne Simpson's book on um, uh, Dancing on a Turtle's Back, and those are the oral histories of uh, the fish nations gathering at the fish weirs, and that continuity. In, this, in, in 1688, I didn't show you on the map. The 1688 map actually says les piquets, the stakes, right at, at uh, where the um, fish weirs are. The French could have made that was there too. So, um, so there is that that evidence of continuity in both sort of the graphic representation, I guess, and in the names that really suggest there is this older history, deeper history there too. Oh, Gary again, sorry. Uh, I recently went. Uh, where the, the uh, community of Geograph unveiled a map, uh, several maps actually, that uh, portrayed the uh, southern Ontario and, and nowhere except for one small little piece of, did they mention the Mississauga. They mentioned the Cayuga, they mentioned all of the different other areas of uh, Anishinaabe uh, history, but it, it excludes us. So in uh, all of our uh, history making, I think that we should correct their math <laughs> so that, you know, so that it, it uh, portrays I think you're 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 um, identifying a really critical problem in that we we are, I think we're still at the really at the beginning stages of really getting at the you know the in indigenous histories of the land that is now Canada and, and, and not and not, what I mean by 
by, by telling those histories in the mainstream that people understand. I mean, I've seen maps that show all of southern Ontario to be all the way up the Bruce Peninsula to be um, uh, Onkwe territory or Wendat territory. Some of the older maps you'll actually see, I think they were just copying uh, Wendat from previous maps, you know, long after 1650. But I also think that there's um, uh, a tension here in focusing too much on the ways in which Europeans fix names to maps even though I spent a lot of time showing you maps, because there's a way in which those categories of exclusion, which is this is ours and that's yours, miss the relationships of interdependence that were forged through alliance that were sort of the characteristic of the way this region was governed. And, um, and I think when you see dots on maps that say the village of the Sauturs was here, well, village is a European political construct. Okay, the Anishinaabe people didn't have villages in that sense, in year-round villages. They had gathering places where, you know, like a Bawating, where 2,000 people would be assembled or more for a summer gathering. And then if you came in November, there wouldn't be anybody there, right? That was a different, a different cartography, a different use of space. There are also all these alliances, um, including with the Wendat, that, you know, these just fixating on um, these really European categories, ideas about what nation is, I think miss this older history of, of interdependent alliances. Like, there's a great uh, description of a, of a council that was held um, the Nipissing hosted it. Uh, it was held in 1641 on Georgian Bay. They, about t they say 20, the Jesuits said about 20 leagues north of where the, where the Wendat were in the Panatanguishing Peninsula. So, you know, depending on how well you do your math, uh, whether you're saying it's a French league or not, is it, you know, 50 kilometers? But anyway, maybe Perry Soundish, maybe a bit further south. It reads like a, a, a great powwow, like a gathering. There's a grand entry of all the nations who come. Who's the farthest nation? The ba Bawating, from people from Bawating. I bet you Mississauga were there too. I bet you all the people from the North Shore were there. And what happens with the Jesuits re recorded that 1641 um, gathering was um, uh, the new chiefs of the Nipissing were elected, as they say. What they mean is, is that all the other regional uh, all the other council fires had to recognize recognize the, the new leadership. So this was part of that governance. They also, um, the, the, that Jesuit um, description also talks about the tremendous gifts that were given, but also the renewal of the alliance between Georgia Bay and Anishinaabe and, and the Wendat in, the, in 1641. So there are all these interdependent alliances, I think, that we, um, that they're, they're there to be sort of teased out a little more and I, maybe get us closer to um, uh, a different kind of a map, I guess, that shows a different kind of a relationship. Well, that's my whole point of this question, is that if we allow the people of Canada to look at that fractured history, then we as Mrs. August are missing our chance in history to correct the fallacies that are there, they should start to, to uh, petition the Canadian uh, Geographic to correct their maps so that they can portray the true treaty people of Southern Ontario. Well said. I think when you start to look at the treaty histories and the al historic alliances and you see these networks of connections that sustained people and the way those alliances were renewed, that's the political geography of Southern Ontario, of the, of, uh, the North Shore of Lake Huron Superior, of the Great Lakes region, right? And it doesn't map very easily into little exclusive blocks, right? It's all these interconnected uh, networks of people who sustained each other through these alliance relationships. So thank you. I think there's a nutrition break. <laughs> Awesome.
Pastor Miigwe Chaidi. And on behalf of the organizing committee, we have a gift for you for your work you've done today. So thank you, Miigwe Chaidi.